some speculation we might be in for a surprise because Flutie is dressed. Yeah, Doug Flutie's been lobbying all week to play in this game, and Wally Bono's finally relented. He's going to let him take the first snap of the game, try to get the crowd revved up, get a psychological edge, but they don't want to take any further chances because he's going in for surgery tomorrow. It's Garcia's game to win or lose against Chris Vargas. And my partner's got that look in his eye because it's Labor Day, and there's two young quarterbacks really in the fire. We're talking about trial by fire today, and we're going to get an initiation for these two young quarterbacks. I tell you what, that young girl that tried to get into the University uh, uh, Citadel is going to think that that was tough. Wait till you see how these two people, Willie Pless and Alondra Johnson, the head chefs out there, turn the heat up in the kitchen today. Yeah, the defense is a big story going into this game. All you have to know about the Eskimos, they lead in turnovers. They're number two in sacks, Stampeder's toughest team to run against. And both coaches agree that it's the team that handles the pressure of the opposite defense that's going to win this game today. Mark? Chris, can't wait to get started. Coming right up in three hours' time, we'll take you to Toronto, the Argos, and San Antonio. The return of Bob Obelovich, his third stint as coach after firing Mike Farragalli. Scott Oak standing by in Toronto. Mark, it's Skydome today. It's OB3, the beginning of Bob Obilovich's third term as head coach of the Argonauts. Seven days ago, he dismissed Mike Farragelli and took over himself. The object of the exercise is to prove that many of the players Obilovich acquired as general manager in the offseason can get the team into the playoffs. Kent Austin was the major acquisition, and OB says the shackles will be off the quarterback today, freeing Austin to do whatever it takes to deliver the Argos to victory over the San Antonio Texans. That's coming up as the second half of our doubleheader. Back to you, Mark. All right, Scott, we'll go to you in about three hours' time, as I mentioned, coming up right after the Stampeders and the Eskimos here in the 35th annual Labor Day Classic, the latest in a long line of legendary football games. Massive defeats like 1990 when the Eskimos slaughtered the Stampeders 38-4. to four. Wild West shootouts. 1991 Danny Barrett engineering a 48-36 Calgary win. The bravado, a guaranteed Calgary win that turned into an embarrassing 34-21 loss. Edmonton picking off six flutie passes to gain some respect. And the intimidation. The Stamps wear special black jerseys last year to avenge their loss to Edmonton in the Western Final. Taylor! Coming up on the BF Goodrich TA Halftime, we'll hear from Edmonton linebacker Larry Ruck, who has inflicted himself on Stan Peter offenses over the years. We'll also preview Bob Obilovich's return to the sidelines, Game 2 of our Labor Day twin bill. Well, they haven't had a great summer here in Alberta, but summer is definitely here in all its glory this weekend. Ideal conditions, not a cloud in the sky, and we're set for the opening kickoff. Here's Chris and Danny. Thank you, Mark. Ready now for the 35th Labor Day Classic. Mark McLaughlin kicks it off. 37,317 are in attendance at McMahon, and here is Errol Martin on the reverse, not fooling the Stampeders, Gerald Vaughn. The Eskimos try something tricky to start with. Chris Vargas is the starting quarterback, making his fifth start. He's 3-1 and one as the starting quarterback, coming off a sharp effort last week. And Vargas will have a veteran offensive line, although two injuries at the tackle spot. And these tackles, Chris Green, Leo Gronwagen will be under the gun today. Shalon Baker, the touchdown maker out of Montana. Had a couple last week and has been a Rookie of the Year candidate. First play of the game goes to Eric Blunt, right side, pass to Londra Johnson, and up to the 35-yard line. That's a pickup of nine for Blunt, who was outstanding last week, 139 yards rushing against the Ottawa Rough Riders. That's the thing this young quarterback is going to do, is to try to take, run the ball early and take a little pressure off of this very tenacious Stampeder defense. Led in the middle by the veteran, Stu Laird, the fireman, that can get it done. He's steady. Solid linebacking core, very agile. Pope is a guy that you want to see coming off the corner, getting into Chris Vargas' face a lot. And Coleman, an excellent corner, a very solid in the back end. Second and one, give up the middle. Michael Souls broke off the initial tackle. Out to the 45, Greg Knox, the safety, had to pull down Souls as the
the Eskimos trying to establish a running game against the number one rushing defense in the Canadian Football League. A little smirk you saw on my face in the opening, Chris. It gets you excited when you see two great defensive ball clubs like that. And I really love to watch this play. These guys in the hurry up. They can make a lot of things happen. Vargas' first pass in the flat picked up. Good. 
but they're doing a good job of it. Run just enough, obviously, to come back that first pass to throw the wide side out may not have been in the best choice for the young quarterback. Give him a couple of passes to throw inside to build a little confidence, but now Calgary may have to concern themselves with his scrambling ability. They're into Calgary territory at the 52-yard line after the 15-yard Vargas pickup. Pressure on there. gets a chance to see that ball coming, hanging out there. He's got a great break on it, just does not concentrate and look the ball in. Will Johnson doing a good job of containment, forces Chris Vargas to pull the ball down. That's the kind where the young quarterback needs to make the decision, just eat it and then re-scrimmage again. You think we're going to see another out today? One interception, one almost. Second and ten, Vargas over the middle. Overthrowing the intended receiver, Nick Mazzoli. And that brings up third down. Vargas and Mazzoli, dynamite last week. They hooked up for three touchdowns in the romp over Ottawa. Well, for whatever reasons, talking to Ron Lancaster again, he felt that maybe they could exploit the corners of Calgary just a little bit. Obviously, the first two plays that they've tested him, he may change his mind a bit and go back to the inside a little more and try to see if he can get Mazzoli and C.J. Davis involved in the game a bit. Marvin Coleman back and Glenn Harper with a beautiful punt landing on the goal line. And Coleman will wisely concede the single point. So we're even in the Labor Day Classic with 5.35 gone first quarter. Well, here's Jeff Garcia, who will handle the bulk of the work today and check those numbers out last week. That's better than any game Doug Flutie has had this year, so he really won the confidence of his teammates in the battle against Birmingham. Both of these teams had great confidence-building games. Uh, Edmonton against Ottawa, 63-3, to and then Calgary against Birmingham to come in here. But today is the true measuring stick of what's going to happen uh, between these two teams and how good they are. Out of the shotgun, Garcia quickly gets it to Alan Pitts. And Pitts has a first down up at the 48-yard line. Glenn Rogers Jr. in coverage. And Pitts number two in CFL receiving behind his teammate, Dave Sapungis. Leroy Blues had a great year, but uh, what member of the Edmondson Eskimos has not? Expect great pressure from the front seven today. And Larry Rux, a veteran of these Labor Day games. Willie Pless, a top defensive player. And what a year Darian Hagan has had in a rebuilt secondary for the Eskimos. First down, Garcia gets it away. There's Sapungis down at the Eskimo 40. Dave Sapungis with 208 yards last week against Birmingham. 13 catches. He has his first of the day for 23 yards and is the leader in the Canadian Football League. Flag fell after the tackle on Sapungis. Disqualification for rough play, number 26, Edmonton, 25-yard penalty. Wow. That's Glenn Rogers, Jr. He's done for the day. What a loss. That is a tremendous loss for the Edmonton secondary. It really throws a curveball into Coach Lancaster's plans. The backup guy is John Kalen, a safety out of the University of Calgary, who was in Calgary before. Now they've got to come in. They've got Kalen. They've got Trent Brown. Trent will have to play the halfback. Kalen will move to the safety. Well, they lost a DB last year by disqualification once the game was over. And they say that Glenn Rogers Jr. is working on the ankle well after the play here. And disqualification. Kalen is the only extra yeah. back. There's got to be more to it than what we just saw on the replay there because if that was the disqualification, forget about it. Neil Payne's got to let these guys play football out there. This is Labor Day. This is a classic. This is a, comp this is a game fight out there. Pushing and shoving and mouthing is going to take place. You're right, though. An enormous problem for Ron Lancaster now. Well, when you've got a 
think you're Trent Brown, you've been playing safety, and you're doing an excellent job playing safety. He hasn't had to play much halfback. Now he's got to go against Suspungus and Allen Pitts all day long. You bet you're going to earn your money this afternoon. First down after the 23-yard pickup, the 25-yard penalty, and Garcia breaking the tackle of Willie Pless. Garcia shows you he'll take off with the football. And now with the ejection of Glenn Rogers Jr., a Calgary native, John Keelan, has to come in at safety, and the safety Trent Brown moves across. Well, I can tell you one thing. Just from a defensive point of view, if all of a sudden Jeff Garcia is going to start rushing his ball, that falls right into what I wanted to do. I'd rather have him running the ball than throwing the ball downfield to those receivers. They need one. They give to Tony Stewart going up. the ground game to help Garcia. You can see right there, that's Trent Brown, the halfback who comes to the outside. Just not familiar with how to squeeze to force containment. Got caught inside too tightly. That allowed Stewart to get outside, pick up the yardage. He's got to be able to get upfield, force Stewart back inside into where the pursuit is going to take place, and maybe one of the guys are going to make the tackle. Now this is Tony Stewart, touchdown territory. They fake the handoff. started slow last week, posting a record 63 points against Ottawa, but Chris Vargas had just nine yards passing in the first quarter, so young quarterback might take him a little while to get comfortable, if he can get comfortable against this Stampeder defense. First and ten, the their own Johnson, Matt Finley, Will Moore, those boys out there, they're not going to allow him to get comfortable. They're going to get in his face and make it a tough day. for the Stampeders. One of the reasons the, the force is really going to happen is the speed on the outside rush guy. Will Johnson, Dwayne Patterson, Streckles Izakovic are going to get up the field very quickly and force the young quarterback to have to step up or as we just saw, throw off balance and probably throw into the crowd. Gain of two, it's second and eight. Better protection, lots of time. Wally Bono felt 
thought that this guy was a keeper, a really solid man to have on the hot corner. These are two new corners for Calgary and Labor Day action anyway. And Wally Buono's given them high marks so far this year. Coleman at his 26, flag goes down for no yards. And they'll tack the penalty on to that. Just over 10 minutes gone. Kevis Reed was inside that five-yard restraining area, number 24. You see him patting himself right on the chest. He said, that's my bad. He, all he has to do is use that great speed to get down the field for coverage. But you have to pick up the ball and find it. and gets 
right up in the young quarterback's face, and he throws the ball just a little higher and behind Pee Wee Smith. Davis Reed does a good job of concentrating on the ball, coming in, get the hands on it right at the last minute. Forces Calgary into a field goal situation. Well, we mentioned that Flutie has thrown out of this situation in practice. Not going to do it again. This time, McLaughlin's through, and the Stamps now have a 10-point lead as Garcia has looked sharp early on. Alberta Boot Company for the That's quite a triumvirate. John Hopnagel, a former quarterback of the Stampeders in Labor Day Classics. Doug Flutie, Jeff Garcia conferring after an impressive drive, fell three yards short. And the Calgary Stampeders, Albert, and the Giz watching this one on the sidelines. And Tuffy hurt himself against Ottawa. An opening kickoff pulled hamstring to see it's crucial to get him back into this lineup. In the meantime, Eric Blount handling the bulk of the kickoff returns. Up to the 37-yard line, that's a 16-yard return. After a 53-yard kick, I mentioned Vargas a slow start last week. But great confidence among his teammates. He's got great leadership ability for a youngster. I, I have to admit one thing. If I'm a young quarterback like Jeff Garcia, I personally would feel a lot more comfortable sometimes getting over there talking to John Huffnagel and Doug Flutie Possibly even the young quarterback, Chris Vargas. The guy he's got to talk to over there is Kerwin Bell right now. Kerwin Bell still trying to figure out a few things about this game. wonder how unsettling those first two passes were. The first picked off. And off up the middle. The second almost picked off for an interception. The Eskimos still working that ground game. Michael Souls has three. Well, Chris, it's kind of a, a backhanded compliment to the Calgary defensive halfbacks, Kent Leonard and also Gerald Vaughn, that they feel more, uh, that Edmonton feels more comfortable trying to attack on the corners than at the halfback position. with the tackle as the clock winds down in a first quarter dominated by the Stampeders Marvin Colvin again one of these guys that has really added instant field position to an already potent Calgary attack he had 83 yard punt return for a touchdown last week against Birmingham but this is Pee Wee Smith who can run him back too Good downfield coverage by the Eskimos to the 35-yard line. Trent Brown, first downfield for the Calgary State. After the 41-yard punt, and a flag down on the field. That's the final play, first quarter here at McMahon Stadium. We've got a sellout for the Labor Day Classic. Home team up by 10. Back live at McMahon Stadium with Doug Flutie. Doug, I saw you in practice throwing with your right arm and your left arm yesterday. Uh, might we see you throwing a pass in this game before you go to surgery? I doubt it. If, uh, if I could throw, I'd be in there. And if I do throw, it'll swell up and I won't be able to have surgery tomorrow. So no surprises? No, I don't think so. All right. I would have liked to have, but I don't think so. Thanks, Doug. Chris? Well, that's at least not with the right hand. He did try to prove he could throw it with the left hand, but he said only about 20 yards with a little zip on the ball. Garcia's had some zip in the first quarter, and he's got Pitts. And Alan Pitts is up to the 53-yard line, and that catch will make him the all-time leading pass receiver in Calgary Stampeder history. And he surpasses an old guy I had to chase around out there. Tommy Frizzani, Chiefs, number 22. Just a deep First down call, Tony Stewart. Tony Stewart. And I think the Stampeders had a little more success running the ball than they might have expected early on. Well, as I 
said, I, I think that the big key right now is that they're having enough success throwing the ball to all the receivers that they want to. That's opening up this rushing game. Had Glenn Rogers Jr. not gotten thrown out of the game early, I think it's a different ball game. Now, unfortunately, it's going to be a very long day out there for the Edmonton defense. There's Alan Pitts. Approaching 1,000 yards on the season. Stewart on second down, up into by Trent Brown, who's moved across to that defensive halfback spot. And Stewart is going to be short, just short of the first down. This may require a measurement. It's under a yard to go, and Calgary will be gambling on third down. Yeah, you chased Forzani, you chased Huffnagel a bit in Labor Day games. Oh, you didn't have to chase Huffy. Huffy was easy. You could actually see Huffy's face. He'd stand in front of you. He couldn't run away from you too much. But I can guarantee you, Tommy Forzani could run. He was very quick. Now, you're not telling me you were faster than Huffnagel. Oh, I'm telling you that right now on national television. Third down, and that should move the yardsticks. Uh, we'll get a uh, rebuttal from Huffnagel. first down. As good a quarterback as he was, uh, he has quite a track record now as an offensive coordinator. And probably one of the main candidates right now, if he ever wants to be a head coach, he is probably a well-sought-out individual. There's a guy right there. You can just look at the stance, look at the posture on Coach Lancaster. He knows that things aren't going very well for his team right now. He's got a winning record head-to-head -head against Wally Buono, 6-5.
six yards. Here's how they capped it. Not much of a fake outside, but all he does, Trent Brown is so cautious back there, gets his hips, turns to the outside, and Alan Pitt doesn't need very much room to make a lot of things happen. Easy catch and a very excited Jeff Garcia. Yeah, they've been saying this guy's quiet, kind of laid back, a Richie Cunningham type, but uh, didn't look like it after that touchdown throw. Eric Blount and the Eskimos need a spark. consecutive sellout here in the Labor Day Classic. Enjoying this one so far. Chris, I think it's crucial right now that the young quarterback understand the situation. He has to be probably the best defense that they can have. Even like they used to say, the best defense against Flutie's keep him off the field. He has to make first downs, make possession drives right now, and keep the ball in the hands of the Edmonton Eskimos.
said, try to keep this Calgary defense off balance as best they can, misdirection, move the pocket one way, try to throw back across the green. But the one thing that this Calgary defense has is incredible team speed. And they have wonderful ways of pursuit to the ball that they get there, they make a tackle. Everybody is very disciplined in staying and doing their job. And that's why the Edmonton Eskimos are having such a tough time picking up any yardage. Marvin Coleman on the return. Calgary will have the ball at their 39 when we come back Coleman to McMahon. 25-year-old Jeff Garcia out of San Jose State. He was quite frank with us yesterday. He said, I'm going to make some mistakes tomorrow, but Kemp, we haven't seen any yet. Well, it, I think he's being very, uh, very cautious about what he does have to say. But he's out there, and the guys that are around him he's, are really have picked it up a notch. As Wally Bono said, the kid still has to make the read, still has to make the right throw, and he's getting better and better at it each snap. by a stride. And Biwi likes to go downtown. Graduate of Miami of Florida. One of the very few times that you see Emmett to take the safety out of the middle and the read is take it right to the post. Plenty of time for Garcia to throw the ball and it's just right past the outstretched hands of the speedy Pee Wee Smith. Now Pee Wee looking for his first major score of the year. He got in behind the Eskimo secondary there. Second and ten. Time for Garcia. Sapatia seemed to enter some territory at the 50. And John Kalen came across. But Kemp, we cannot underestimate the ejection of Glenn Rogers Jr. Because the Stamps are enjoying this afternoon in that secondary. Really is a good place, but what Edmonton's trying to do is to make an adjustment. They have Larry Ruck over here, and Trent Brown is behind. Now, here is Sapunjas. All he's going to do, he reads the double coverage, and all of a sudden, the young quarterback wants to come back to the wide side of the field, and there he finds Sapunjas, go single coverage, and he makes the reception. 21 yards for Sapunjas, just a couple on that carry by Tony Stewart. Well, Jeff Garcia, no... Uh, not uh, great experience in throwing the football in the Big West Conference. Uh, threw it 40 times a game. Playing for San Jose State, he was often pitted against Chris Vargas, the University of Nevada, Reno. Also, Anthony Cavill, the Hamilton quarterback, was in the conference. Trent Dilfer, a quarterback with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And these guys all got great experience in that conference throwing the football. Here, first half. Third down, 
Here's what's in store for the BF Goodrich TA halftime. Larry Ruck, the Eskimo career leading tackler, the anchor man of the CFL's best defense, having trouble today, and we'll preview the Toronto San Antonio game two of our Labor Day doubleheader. Chris? Well, heat on Bob Opilovich and the Toronto Argonauts to get things going after Labor Day. Will Johnson sizing things up after tracking down Kerwin Bell, forcing this punting situation. Harper angling it out of bounds. 2.31 to go, first half. And the Stampeders up 19-1. to Not the kind of kick that you want to have in a game like this. You would think that it's only a 29-yard punt for Glenn Harper came in with a 39-yard average. Big teams like this that play great defense, the big key that happens a lot is who wins the, the special teams games. And right now, you need to have a guy like Glenn Harper when their offense is sputtering enough to be able to boom out some howitzers out there to get the balls deep and at least try to make Jeff Garcia start on as long a field as possible. to the inside 
the young quarterback had led him toward the post just a little bit more as opposed to throwing it over the outside shoulder. Then that would allow the, the receiver to create a little more void between he and the and the cornerback. Then that catch becomes very on, uh, catchable. Place, that pass becomes very catchable for Calgary. Martino blasted the last one. This one not as deep, but Blount, that is 10. need a spark, but they're going to start deep in their own zone. Ray Biggs leads this Calgary defense on special teams tackles. This Calgary defense plays big time special teams every time they play against the Edmonton Eskimos. They're just hoping that the Giz was back there because they have shut him out over the past Labor Day games. this year for Edmondson and he has been the best C.J. Davis inside and Nick Mazzoli have given them a little more punch. This Eskimo team there's Mazzoli. They've scored 95 points in the last two games but just one so far today. Here's Blount. And Eric Blount breaking away running to daylight. Foot race. Gerald Vaughn was the only man with a chance maybe Coleman. No! Three of them, and he 
said yesterday, I have to play mistake-free football. There is nothing else more important that makes a player fall out of the grace of the head coach than fumbling the football. And Tony Stewart has had his fair share of problems with that. Fortunate, though, that the whistle had gone. First down, Garcia wide open is Terry Vaughn. Vaughn's got to get out of bounds. And I think he just did. Davis Reed, Darian Hagan on the tackle. It's a first down, 22 seconds to go. The and the Stampeders trying to get some points back. First and 10 at the 49-yard line. Yeah, we got you heard it from Wally Bottom. Chance for a field goal. We just got to get the ball up the field about 15 yards, maybe 10 yards. Give Mark McLaughlin a chance to stretch that leg out a bit. Can you say Alan Pitts? Well, we got the double coverage out in the areas. Maybe look for Spud. coverage. I was wrong, but Kepley and ISO director Bud Stanton were right on it. Take a look. Larry Ruck's going to come out and try to get underneath this, but when Dave, Dave Sapphire just makes that break across the middle, he's got a great burst of speed to create just enough cushion that allows Jeff Garcia to get that ball in there. Under 10 seconds to go, close to McLaughlin, field goal range, Pitts. interference against Edmonton. Let's see if it was called on the other side. To the right-hand side of your screen, he's trying to throw the out to Alan Pitts. He gets one hand up. It tips off John Holland, but all of a sudden, Pee Wee Smith, great presence of mind to be able to pick up the tip. Makes the reception. Little bit for us on pass interference, Edmonton number 17. Penalties decline. First down. In the hands of three guys. Holland called on the pass interference, and Mark McLaughlin is called upon for the third time. Mark McLaughlin. And this will be from just outside the 35. Should be well within his range. His longest has been 52. His first kick just really wasn't that good, though. This one's okay. room with a 14 point lead. where the Stampeders lead the Eskimos 22-8 at halftime in the Labor Day Classic. Two games yesterday in the CFL. Let's start first by taking you to Regina, the scene of the Labor Day weekend clash between Saskatchewan and Winnipeg. A record crowd of 31,308 at Taylor Field, and this was a nightmare. First, Brian Randall picks off Reggie Slack late in the second quarter and returns it all the way for a touchdown. Plays Bryant gives up at 22 nothing at the half, Saskatchewan. Then, second half, this is Dan Farthey picking up a halfback wide receiver option, whatever that was, for a touchdown. It's 36 to nothing. The route is on. Then, Ray Elgar, his second touchdown catch of the game and unbelievably of the season, the worst loss for the Blue Bombers, 56 to 4 in team history. The other game at Shreveport, Memphis defeating the Shreveport Pirates 31 to 22. The Pirates now 5 and 6 and in third place in the South Division. While here in the West, defense has always been the strong suit of the Edmonton Eskimos. When it comes to linebackers, they make the mold. Kepley, Bass, and now, Larry Ruck. In a few words, I'd have to describe myself as just uh, kind of your average, average everyday guy. Honest, uh, hardworking. I guess I enjoy the, the competition. Um, you know, there's lots of highs and lows. And, uh, you can't really appreciate the highs without experience. 
experiencing the lows. But uh, when, when you go out there and uh, on, on Sunday or on game day and uh, you're able to dominate a football team and, and uh, pretty much do everything that you'd set out to do, I tell you, that's a pretty good feeling. I guess I've only, I've only missed a, a couple of games because uh, a couple of reasons. I guess I've been blessed with the genetics from my parents that I have, uh, you know, the type of body makeup, I guess, that's uh, pretty resilient. And, of course, uh, hours and hours spent in the weight room. You've, you've got to gotta get in the weight room, especially during the season. Um, not so much to you know, build your strength up so much, but to prevent injuries. My job outside of football has uh, been Edmonton Freightliner here for the past three years. I try and go in the office every day that we're in town. I go in there in the mornings from 8 till 1 or so, and then, uh, then, then it's you know, over to my, uh, my other lifestyle, which is football, which is, which is vastly different from the real world. There's a lot of pressure in, in professional sports, there's no question. There's uh, uh, a lot of stress. A lot of pressure from not only yourself, uh, the organization, the, the fans, everyone involved. There's a lot of stress there, and you need something uh, sort of as a release, as a way to get it all away from it all and escape. And I find if I go out and play a round of golf, that really does the trick for me. Anytime I can sort of just forget about it, even if it's just for a few hours, uh, it, it helps me a great deal. I try and play as aggressive as possible, and uh, I think that's what's got me to where I am today. I've always been, been that way and, uh, ever since I pulled on my first helmet. From junior football on the prairies to the best pro defense in the country, Larry Ruck continues to add to his Eskimo career record for tackles. It's 568 and counting with two more today, just like this one on Dave Sapunjas in the first half. Calgary leading the Eskimos 22 to 8 at the half. We're back right after this. Right you are, Scott. It's always a big sky here in the West at the Labor Day Classic. A 14-point lead for the Stampeders in Game 1. Looking forward to joining you at 6 Eastern with the Argos and Texans. Right now, for their thoughts on the first half of this ball game, let's go to the broadcast booth and join Danny and Chris. Well, Mark Kemp, I almost feel like the score flatters the Eskimos through one half of football, but that ejection of Glenn Rogers Jr. set the course for the entire first half. Well, it really did. It's a monumental play, and, and, and they, we now find out that it was a kick after the play, but even if it was, it's a bogus call it just turned this whole complexion of the first half of this ball game around and then the Stampeders started to steamroll and the guy who scores the first touchdown believe it or not his first CFL touchdown it was Marvin Pope with a nice little pass from Jeff Garcia tell you what as I said taking a little page out of the textbook of the Edmonton Eskimos using Willie Plus Jeff Garcia had some heat and then all of a sudden big daddy's in the end zone all by himself good catch great hands now, the Stampeders continue to roll with Garcia because Glenn Rogers is out. Trent Brown ends up having to try and control Alan Pitts. Just get ready because we're going to mention those two names a lot in the second half. And Alan Pitts turns the best of defenders around, more and less a guy that has to come over from the safety position. But one late play by the Eskimos makes the second half an interesting one. Calvary gets the kind of defense that they want. They want to throw the ball in front of them. Then they just make poor tackling. But to his credit, Eric Blunt does an excellent job breaking the tackles, gets down the field, shows some tremendous speed, and gives Edmonton a little bit of an optimistic view going in at the halftime. Well, we'll find out if the Eskimos can use that as a springboard in the second half. Mark? Chris, Jeff Garcia showing his savvy, taking advantage of the Glenn Rogers Jr. ejection. He's engineered a 14-point lead at the half. The kickoff is next. The CFL on CBC. Brought to you by BF Goodrich TA. Performance. Serious performance. Welcome back to McMahon Stadium in Calgary. Second half about to begin with the kickoff from Mark McLaughlin. And Eric Blount to dazzle us with that 99-yard touchdown has the football. Over the 30 to the 32. And the Eskimos go back to work. Greg Knox with the tackle on Blount. The Eskimos back to work on offense with Kerwin Bell at the controls in relief of Chris Vargas. 
See the numbers when he that short stint that he had in the first half, two of four for 110 yards. Most of that yard is coming on the 99-yard screen pass to Eric Blunt. Lucky to get that one away. There's the newcomer, Dwayne Patterson, out of Washington State. Now this guy is a player. You get a wide open shot at a, at a backside of a quarterback who's not very mobile. He doesn't have to make very much move when the guy's going full speed like that as a defender. Just one little sidestep, and he's able to buy a little extra time. Second and ten, and here they come again. Ball passed over the middle for C.J. Davis in complete. The Eskimos looking for a penalty. The Stampeders not penalized once in the first half. And Vargas on the headphones. Well, this is, a, a, unfortunately for him, a, a position that he was very familiar to at the beginning of this season because Kerwin Bell was signed as the guy to be the number one quarterback. And the youngster has come up and really played extremely well and got an opportunity to show himself. It's a good tandem right now, so now Kerwin Bell has an opportunity to try to get his starting position back. The interesting part of that last graphic, they have not completed a pass to a slot back today. There's a better kick by Harper. That's a beauty. And Marvin Coleman inside his 20. Past the first wave, and he's dangerous. The slippery Marvin Coleman across midfield. And that's a big tackle by Malvin Hunter. Well, the Stamps get instant field position to start the second half. It's a 40-yard return by number 17, Marvin Coleman, who's third returns in the CFL this year. The Eskimos get a little help with the big booming kick. They have great coverage, but then the Calgary special teams does such an excellent job. They have a guy back there that they know once he gets his hands on the ball, all I have to do is if I make my block, Coleman can break it and take it to the house at any point in time. It's good look at Jeff Reinbold, the special teams coach, and you can see the frustration that he's showing. Garcia's first pass, second half, Pitts. Pitts into the arms of Trent Brown. But onto the turf incomplete. Garcia has not thrown an interception this year. A couple of touchdowns today, seven on the season. And he's over 1,000 yards passing on the year. Chris, we talked a bit about the offensive lines of both his team. Whichever one has the success in taking the heat and cooling it off are going to be the most productive offensively. And right now, Calgary has had that opportunity. They are really limiting what Edmonton can do defensively as far as heat-wise. Pass behind Sapungis. Off his fingertips incomplete. And it brings up third down. On the coverage, number 19. Good success, though, for Garcia inside to the slots today. Fitz has been a prime receiver, and Sapunjus the second favorite target. Jeff They're Garcia really wanted to have that pass back. He had the sponge down there, squatting down in the zone, right in the open area where he did, and he just threw the ball behind him. And we talked about some exciting players right now. Shalon Baker, this is a guy that can also, once he gets his hands on the ball, has got great speed and can make a lot of things happen. See what he does here. Comes up and gets the no yards. Takes a big hit from Greg Prayers, the reserve safety, but they'll tack 15 on for no yards. We're three minutes in to this second half. Year after year, it always seems to be perfect on Labor Day in Calgary. Weather-wise, sellout crowd at McMahon Stadium. And for the most part, but for the thousand or so that drove down from Edmonton, it's been a good day. Good day for a drive so far. That's about, that's about what it's been worth so far in this first half. AJ came over there like one of those uh, heat-seeking missiles and just absolutely leveled. Let's go. 
Legal contact, Calgary number 91 on receiver. Penalty is declined. First down. Marvin Pope called. And it's a first down. So Lucius Floyd is in. A tender ankle kept him out last week. He was a little concerned about how much he could cut on the ankle. We need everybody on the count of three to yell huddle up. Here's the pass to Sandusky. That's his first reception of the game across midfield. Jim Sandusky, number seven, takes the pass. Al Jordan with the tackle and the veteran Sandusky with his first catch, looking for his first 100-yard game of the year. Chris Ron Lancaster felt that what they had to do offensively a little bit, slide the pocket ever so slightly, get some slide blocking up front, throw the quick out and hot stuff to their receivers because that's the time that they were going to have. They're not going to have a lot of time to stand in the pocket. Here's a wide open receiver and it's Nick Mazzoli with his first catch. So Kerwin Bell, back to back completions. Zero bottom at 38, Marvin Pope, 91 combined for the stop. It's got to be very disappointing for Nick Mazzoli. This is his first catch so far in this game. Last week, as you can see, six catches, 152 yards, three touchdowns. He just turned the house out up in Commonwealth Stadium. Renfrew tries Having his best career season. Football team. And that's Sreko Zizakovic down. That Clayton out looking at his ankle. You're downtown. Just over three minutes into this second half at McMahon Stadium. The Stampeders up by 14. Frank Speziani, the defensive coordinator, taking this time out. Get some instructions in. And Sreko is on his feet. Had a Labor Day touchdown back in 1991. Had a 36 yard interception touchdown against Ottawa earlier in the season. And you can see just how involved every time that Garcia comes to the sideline, the first guy that he's in his ear is Doug Flutie talking to him and maybe just he may be redundant in what he's saying but he want to make sure that he is seeing Garcia he's seeing exactly what Doug Flutie is seeing on the sideline first down for the Eskimos first and ten from the Calgary 39 deepest drive for the Eskimos today Lucius Floyd gets the call and has a hole and Floyd powers his way inside the 25 yard line that's a pickup of 16 Good rush off that left side. Now, this is the thing he did. Kerwin Bell had slid out there before and threw the out. Now he's going to slide out a bit. Give the draw play to Lucius Floyd. Good blocking up front by Green and Hendrickson. Hendrickson, the left guard, was very slow getting up. But they don't have anybody else. You've got to stay in there and play. First down. looked a little like Flutie there, kind of across the side of his body. The only thing I got a question right there, you've got, you've got, Baker is over there, he's covered, now you're trying to throw the ball away, throw the ball up into the stands somewhere, don't throw it into the playing field, where now two Calgary defenders has a chance to pick it off. Second and ten, here comes the Heat, ditching it off to Floyd. And Lucius stopped up, Stu Laird finished him off, Kenny Walker hanging on, Alondra Johnson in the neighborhood. What terrific acceleration and pursuit down the line of scrimmage by Walker and Stu Laird both read that screen beautifully. And Bell is upset. Perhaps. Let's go, shit. Well, it looked like somebody missed an assignment. Come on. 
back in the game prior to the end of the first half. A last second field goal made it 22 to 8. Tony Stewart with the carry on first down up to the 39, gain of four. And in the second half, Bashan Fleming, 30 yard field goal makes it 22 11. Willie Quest, number 39. Tony Woods, number 91, also in on that. Production that time as far as the offensive line getting off, trying to catch Edmonton a little bit off guard by rushing the ball on first and 10 as opposed to throwing it. But Edmonton reacting very well to the play and shut Stewart down for a gain of about four yards. Stampeders have won the last two Labor Day Classics. Eskimos winning in 92. Here's Terry Vaughn with the first down. And Vaughn coughs it up. Eskimos have the football, at least. That's the indication at the green and gold bench. And they do. And you can feel a real momentum shift here, Kemp, and it started with the Black 99-yarder. Willie Pless has come up with the football. Big turnover, and that's the kind of thing you have to do defensively. When your offense is sputtering, and it's the thing. Go out, make a turnover, make a big play, stop them on down, get the ball back into the offense's hands as quickly as you can. You can see where Vaughn's carrying the ball on the inside. Okay, and that allows where all the heat's coming from and the pursuit, and that's Willie Pless was able to get the hands on it, strip it down, and give Kerwin Bell first and 10 on the 51.
different complexion on things now. You got a ball game. Don't go anywhere, folks. Not even to the fridge. Being turned up now on Jeff Garcia. Let's see what kind of lift the Eskimos defense gets from this. Pressure on. Garcia threads the needle to Pitts. First down. You know, Jeff, I asked Stu Laird yesterday, uh, were you surprised by Garcia? And he said, you know, we watched him run the scout team every week, and all he did was thread the needle time after time, and he did it there. When you've got a guy like him that runs that scout team, as you just said, and he runs it with a lot of pride, he goes out there and works extremely hard. That's why the Calgary defense is playing so well, because they do have to work hard in practice. This will be the go-to guy right now that you're going to see. Alan Pitt, seventh catch for 105 yards, one big touchdown in the first half. First down, Garcia rolling. Danielson open. Thunderbirds with the catch, and he'll move the sticks for the Stamps. It has taken a couple of years for Danielson to get the confidence of a guy like Doug Flutie to be the go-to guy also. He is the fifth guy in their, their five-pack receiving core now, and it will be a very short time that he can build up his confidence and his rapport with a young quarterback. Kept this like could Jeff be a, Garcia. Excuse me, this could be a real problem. Trent Brown now down, and the Eskimos don't have any more defensive backs. The only guy that, that they may be able to substitute in there somewhere is Singor Mobley that they may have to put in somewhere, which would possibly be, I would suggest, if, if hopefully the Trent Brown would be okay for the Eskimos uh, cause. Singor could possibly play the safety, move over John Kalen to the halfback, but then that would really limit what Edmonton could do defensively. You're going to have to see a lot of zone. Ian Hallworth taking a serious look at the right knee of Trent Brown, who's been on the hot seat today since the ejection of Glenn Rogers. We'll take a break. Time out, Pat McMahon. Back in Calgary, where the defense is awaiting as Trent Brown continues to get attention and uh, we can only speculate as you mentioned the outside linebacker Mobley may have to move in for Brown let's find out what happened take a look just as he's planning and now he's trying to push off with that right foot he's trying to turn plant on the tarp and then be able to move up field and create some speed to try to keep up with Alan Pitts and all of a sudden Trent Brown just buckles underneath where you can only speculate I guess he's walking off under his own power right now but it could be just a quick tear or maybe a little piece of cartilage that gets float caught into the joint. He seemed to be having a, a very hard time getting off the field. Five-year veteran, University of Alberta, having a terrific season. Five interceptions, a couple of them last week against Ottawa. So it's a first down for the Stampeders. Guess who's at safety? Lucius Floyd. Territory, 6.35 to go, third quarter. Garcia and the Stampeders have seen their lead dwindle to four points. I don't think the scenario changes very much right now for Jeff Garcia. You've just taken out Trent Brown. You're putting in John Kalen in there. The same thing goes. Whoever is Kalen is covering, that's the go-to guy. stat on Garcia, 301 yards passing so far. It's the ninth consecutive game the Stamps have got over 300. Five games this year over 400. One of the things that Edmonton is trying to do defensively is the sense they put Kalen and they're going to put him to the short side of the field, the short side of the formation all the time. Walk a linebacker like Larry Ruck out there and try to give him as little area to cover as possible with help. Second and ten. Garcia took a hit going deep. It's picked off. Darian Hagan. And the Eskimos defense comes up big, and you can give Tony Woods a big assist because he was bearing in on Jeff Garcia. Number 91, Tony Woods. And you can hear the Eskimos giving Lucius Floyd a... Hey, we can't take anything off, eh? There's Pete Laverato. Pete Laverato, an old teammate of mine. 
Works with the defensive line, and I just want to say a quick note while we have a chance. Pete came up to me right before the game and said, look, this is a big day for my dad back in Edmonton. Carmen, he said it's his 75th birthday, and he just wanted to say, Dad, happy birthday to you. He'll be home tonight. Just to say, listen, Pete, so, he's such an enthusiastic guy, very active as a coach, talking to his guys constantly. Right now, he's got a major concern, though, because Hagan, who came up with his third interception, is still down. And, well, they've got Lucius Floyd as safety already. Uh, they don't want their other running back at defensive halfback, do they? Well, you can, you can only anticipate what Ian Hallworth is saying. He's, he's looking down very seriously in one of those medical kind of, uh, you know, stare, glazed looks and going, you have to get up. We don't have anybody else. Yeah, but they've called have, for the cart. You have to get up. And this is just an unbelievable turn of events for Ron Lancaster. It's almost like a jinx in the secondary. It started with the Rogers disqualification. Trent Brown goes down. And now Hagan, after a big play to snuff a Calgary drive, it's a four-point football game with 5.50 to go third quarter. So let's take a look and see if we can pick out what happened as he comes back across the field. As he makes he makes that hard plant right there on the turf. He gets stuck in the back of the head by Sapungus. And you really can't see an ankle or a knee or anything that may buckle. But unfortunately, you, you take that risk, you run it any time that you're playing on turf. Because once these turf shoes grasp down on that astro turf, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't give. The one thing that gives is happens to be a ligament or a cartilage or something in your body. Well, Hagen couldn't get up, but they've told Trent Brown he's going to have to. So looks like Brown, Brown is going to be all right to return to the game. Boy, that's a tough spot for uh, Lucius Floyd to come into. And I had to smile, Kep, because I've never seen a safety play so deep before. Well, I, I think it all of a sudden, if, if you want to be jokingly about it, you're thinking Lucius is the safety. He says, can you believe that they put me in safety with two inexperienced halfbacks out here? <laughs> he said, at least if I'm going to play safety, give me two halfbacks that have been playing halfbacks. Just told us that 
Darian Hagen is having his hip looked at. He made the interception on the last Calgary series. Trent Brown went out with a knee, but is back in. Take a look, but he's out there. He's holding the knee and playing, and he's favoring it completely. He's just a body taking up space up there. He's not a football player helping that defense out right now. That's unfortunately for, for him. Well, can Garcia capitalize? Rolls out. Now back over the middle. It's complete. Pee Wee Smith comes across. And now we've got another Eskimo on the limb. I think that's Errol Martin. No, it's Brown back down. Ron Lancaster really... Uh, earlier, Errol Martin may be the guy that has to come in, but you can just take a look. I mean, poor Trent Brown, I gotta say, he just can't move. There is something obviously seriously wrong with the knee. He can't plant, he can't push, he can't accelerate. And those are three really key ingredients that you have to have to play football, play defensive back. Kemp, you wanted to play. I mean, the jersey may still be down there in the... <laughs> I had I had an opportunity and, and last uh, couple of weeks ago was was Rolly Miles's funeral that he had and there was a, a number of Eskimo guys there old guys were there Norm Kimball was there who had started the Eskimo regime a long time ago and I said Norm I said you signed anybody lately I said uh, you know uh, minimum salary is 26.5 he says I'll give you 18.7 you want to take it I said yep I'll take it right now but you can take a look, good look at. Uh, the pain that Trent Brown's going through. So the guys that are there, Errol Martin says he's not a big oversized linebacker. He's 6'2", 205. He's one guy that they can bring in. And they actually do that. They leave. Martin's in. Mobley's dropped back now into the secondary. And Garcia throws a completion of Pitts. And this is a lethal situation. Alan Pitts allowed to roam in this battered up Eskimo secondary. He could finish with some big numbers unless the Eskimos can get some heat on Garcia. Well, if you've ever heard the term, uh, this is easy as shooting fish in a barrel, this is exactly what it's going to be like. You spread those five receivers across the board of a, a very inexperienced in secondary, and you just pick the who you want to throw the ball to. First down at midfield. Garcia has another open the receiver. He took a hit. Another first down catch. Now Robert Holland, one of the few guys left back there. The key to this, at some point, you're in a, a catch-22 situation. The first four guys are not getting the kind of heat on Garcia that needs to be turned up to force him to throw the ball quickly. So then you have to bring linebackers, and then that just leaves too much area back there or man-to-man -man coverage, which these guys are just not used to playing in the secondary of the Eskimos. Minute 15 to go, third quarter. Garcia pumps once, goes deep. Pee Wee Smith, touchdown!
the Eskimos that closed within four. Still plenty of time left, though. 57 seconds to go, third quarter. And Trent Brown is now done for the day. Hagen gone. Rogers ejected. That's the heart of the secondary. The two halves and the safety out for the day. And they dressed only one extra DB. The green and gold are going to keep at it, though. Well, you can bet they're going to keep at it. It's not over till it's over. The same old cliche stand true. You, when you come down here to Calgary on the Labor Day Classic, you know for a fact it's a 60-minute game fight, and you don't stop until the last whistle. Ron Lancaster said yesterday, we don't know how good we are. We're going to find out. This may not be an accurate litmus test, though, because of the injuries in the secondary. Well, I, I don't think in this case Ron Lancaster is not the kind of man that would look for any kind of excuses. Injuries going to happen to any team around the league. It's just how well you adjust to that kind of stuff. He's having to do a heck of a lot of adjusting out there. Good protection for Bell. Shalon Baker has the catch just over the 50-yard line. Boy, the Eskimos excited about Shalon Baker, who may be the most promising receiver they've signed since Brian Kelly in 1979. Kelly was a Rookie of the Year, and folks in Edmonton think Shalon Baker will be too. Well, and Brian Kelly, the year that he was Rookie of the Year, he set a record, 61 catches, 1,098 yards in 1979. Shalon Baker should be able to break that easily. Well, Steve Krupe, who went out of the game earlier with an injury, jumped. Have to hit For a Labor Day Classic, the one thing that you do have to say, it has been a fairly penalty-free ball game. Our Kelly stats in 79, and Baker well on his way. In fact, he's on pace to challenge Matt Clark's rookie record of over 1,500 yards. Here's Michael Souls in the flat, and he's into Calgary territory with a first down. And the Eskimos offense trying to close the gap, stay in the ball game, and keep that defense off. That's the end of the third quarter. Calgary up by 11. Scoring here. 
Kenton Leonard, number 30. And if you just take a look, Kenton Leonard has an excellent opportunity. He makes the break underneath the receiver, but he just anticipates it and cuts it. It's a 
big break for the guys in red. It's Calgary football. Larry with two interceptions already this year. Garcia does a good job to get outside of containment, but then he's throwing the ball back, pelling way off balance, throws it into the crowd. Larry Rudd does, in fact, make that interception. The ball stripped loose by Jamie Crysdale, who comes up with it also. That's the first interception for Jeff Garcia this year. 51st turnover forced by the Eskimos, but they gave it right back. Stewart smothered, and Larry Ruck was there to help finish him off. Larry Ruck with a little added extra frustration after dropping that, fumbling that ball after the interception. Alvin Hunter, number 46, on the bottom of the pile. You see how intently Larry Ruck looking at Pete Lavarado on the sideline, picking up the defensive signals. And on the other side of the ball, Jeff Garcia picking up those signals from John Huffnagel. Got an injured Stampeder. That's Bruce Beaton. The left tackle forced into a starting role this year with the injury early in the season to old Canadian Bruce Coverton. And Beaton will sit down for at least a play or two. Give an opportunity for Jay McNeil to come in. Jay McNeil, 6'4", about 285 out of Kent State in his second year with the Calgary Stampeders. Well, this game rarely disappoints the Labor Day Classic, and that's been the case again today. Garcia, lots of room, and he'll pull it down, and has the first down. And he'll move the yardstick, so he can't scramble when he has to. And the Stamps now have 100 yards rushing on the day. Jeff does a great job. He spreads his offense, empty backfield set, spreads that Edmonton defense all the way across the board. This is the call play right from the get-go. Takes it from the shotgun position to the wide side of the field. Sniffs out that first down marker and slides ahead for it. First down give to Stewart. Met by Plus. And down to the 31-yard line. Pick up a 5-6. This has been a courageous effort by the Eskimos under the circumstances. It's a completely remade secondary. Holland's still there, but he's moved inside. Hagen hurt. Brown hurt. Rogers ejected. And guys like Willie Bless and Singor Mobley trying to hang on. Leroy Blue with his fifth sack of the year. Out of Bishop's University, seven-year veteran. Ron Lancaster said uh, again, it's been another fantastic year for number 89. Great penetration, acceleration off the line of scrimmage. He's able to get up there and beat out the block of Bob Pandelitis, who was pulling out in front on that bootleg. One of the key assets that Leroy Blue does possess is his ability to run upfield very quickly and get that speed. He had the containment, and then also he had some help with Tony Woods coming from the backside. This will be a 47-yard try by McLaughlin. Flutie puts it down. McLaughlin's got plenty of leg, but he misses. And Blount will give up the single, so it's an 11-point lead. 37-26, 14 to go. Warm up underway with the roof open. This one far from done though. An 11 point lead for Kerwin Bell's been sharp. Ditches it off Souls. Lunging ahead for a couple. Kent Leonard moved up to stop the big McGill product. Chris, again, I think the only thing that I that I, I can see that the Edmonton Eskimo offense is doing right now, trying to get it back all in one time where Kuro and Bell wants to take it downtown and try to give up, get the home run ball. This Calgary defense is not going to give you that. Baker took his eye off the football. Fell out the puck. They wanted to keep the defense on the bench. Leroy Blue now getting attention. 3.34 left. Dr. Peter Boucher, the orthopedic surgeon that is with the Edmonton Eskimos, taking a look at Leroy Blue. And a good look at Glenn Harper. If he can kick one, you know, the way that he has the last. 
deep into their own end. Now, you know, Kept the wind really has picked up here the last half hour or so. Harper kicking that one into the wind, and uh, it's usually a factor at McMahon Stadium. It hasn't been today until the last few minutes. Just a 23-yard punt. Caster still not done today. He's got a big job ahead of him. These two teams are going to get right back into the street fight Friday at Commonwealth Stadium. Benny Good shaking up on the last series, but he's back. And here's Sean Daniels with a rare carry. Malvin Hunter stops him near the line of scrimmage. John Daniels, number 34, the ball carrier. Jeff Garcia very contented to try to run this ball inside and run some time off the clock. Good look at Corwin Bell on the sideline with his offensive lineman. And we're under three minutes to go here at McMahon Stadium. There's Robert Holland still directing traffic in that rebuilt Eskimo secondary this afternoon. And I'll tell you what, he's really assumed a leadership role back there. Just make sure he doesn't go outside. If he goes outside, you got to turn and go. This was just a few moments ago as he was giving John Kalen last-second instructions on how to play the corner. First down, Garcia. There's Danielson cutting it back. And Danielson's into Edmonton territory at the 50-yard line. Pickup of 12 for Big Vince Danielson, Bruce Dixon on the tackle. And Garcia starting to pad the stats. Danielson does an excellent job of reading this kind of coverage, and he slides to the outside. He and Garcia are on the same page. Garcia is able to deliver the ball to him, and then he worked very well back into the field and get the ball up the field to pick up the first down. To the 45 as close to five. Well, you've got the lead, and I'm sure there's a temptation here to keep the ball in the air because of the Eskimo secondary woes, but you want to grind it out and try and finish it off. Do you think Garcia will go to the air much down the stretch, Kep? I think if he has to, if, if he falls a little short in his first down production and it makes it second and long, it gives him the opportunity to go deep. But as long as this offensive line can get off the off the, the mark and pick up some yardage, he won't have to. Hey, he calls his own number. No, throws back. And Sapuntas has it. And that's another first down. Under two minutes left now. And the Stampeders have taken full control now with the 11-point lead and the clock running out on Edmonton. Well, there's Dad in from Gilroy, California. Hi, Gilroy, California. <laughs> hey, we're right here. It's beautiful, Calgary. And Gilroy, <laughs> all 5,000 people. Hey, we're going to do it. All right. Hey, he's excited. Gilroy, by the way, 30 miles south of San Jose. And Jeff telling me yesterday, big fan of the San Jose Sharks. Daniels. John Daniels for two or three. With the first down, okay? Inside the 30. Mr. Pless doing the job again on defense for Edmondson. Now the last play that he ran when he was in second and long in this situation, he came out on the bootleg, and nobody was really respecting the fact that he was going to run outside. He threw it back inside to Dave Sapuntis. Let's see if he comes back for the same kind of play. Move the pocket around a little bit. He's out of the shotgun. Second and six.
No, Dad and a cousin made the trip. Doug Flutie under the knife tomorrow in California. But it would appear that the quarterbacking of the Calgary Stampeders is in capable hands. Ron Lancaster made the comment yesterday talking about this game. He said it was a true measuring stick for the Edmonton offense today. It was a test for the defense. But unfortunately, with the number of injuries that they had, it was even more than a test today. Now you can bet the Eskimos will reload for next Friday at Commonwealth. They'll have over 50,000 on hand for that one. But the Stamps are going to have the bragging rights today. Lout run out of bounds with a minute four to play. Well, let's, let's talk about that just a little bit too, Chris. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know the extent of any of these injuries. And they are not that many great quality defensive backs as depth laying around that you can just take a guy there and then all of a sudden Downfield put four guys in the backfield and have them be able to play against a team like the Calgary Stampeders in five days. You think Kerwin Bell will start Friday? He's been great in a relief role today. That'll be one of the many decisions Ron Lancaster makes in the wake of this one. Bell throwing incomplete to Blount out of the backfield. Not speaking for Ron Lancaster, but I think that, in fact, it will be the easiest of all the decisions that Coach Lancaster has to make through the course of this week. We know Garcia will be starting on Friday. This the fourth highest passing performance by a Calgary quarterback all time. The record is 556 yards by Flutie. Peter Lisk had a 553-yard game. Doug also had a 547-yarder. But this, the fourth best of all time, so Mr. Garcia's had quite a day. 117 attempts, only two interceptions. And in two games, almost 1,000 yards, 962 for Garcia. Under a minute left, and it's a third down situation facing the Eskimos. Rich Stubler, Ron Lancaster haven't had many afternoons quite like this one. It's amazing the way he turned it around last year. They were really hammered on Labor Day a year ago, 48-15, but they came right back and beat the Stamps the following Friday a year ago. There's a flag down on the play. Flag down on that third down incompletion. Corwin Bell is ever so lucky that that ball was thrown short on the hop. If it's not, it's seven points. Three Edmonton penalty decline. First down. It's seven points for Marvin Coleman going the other way. Instead, it's a penalty decline and a turnover on downs. But we surely like to wish all the best to Doug Flutie on uh, the big events that are happening through the course of this week for him and, uh, and his future. Again, surgery tomorrow, and although Doug wanted to throw the ball today, they could not risk any further inflammation. Otherwise, the surgery, as he mentioned to Mark Lee, might have to be canceled. So Flutie goes under the knife. Tomorrow in California, he'll return to Calgary a week from now. We hope to see him next year, although Doug still thinks, here's more for Pitt's touchdown. Garcia going right back.
points for Garcia, three for Pitts. Garcia had enough space, he could have ran that ball in on his own, but he just decides to take it downtown to the big guy, Alan Pitts. the secondary because of an ejection and injuries and Pitts has done it for the second straight year. Different quarterback, same results. Edmonton Eskimos through the course of this season just riddled with injuries, decimated with up front of the offensive lineman. Now has to go a whole patchwork in the secondary. It'll be a true test for this coaching staff and some of these veterans around that locker room to rise up to the challenge that this young quarterback and his team are going to bring in the Commonwealth Stadium yeah, Peters, let's Friday go. night. Well, Kep, I'll admit it. I figured the over-under on this one was like 20. I thought... Well, wait, wait a second. Wait, don't pad yourself. I heard what you said. What number? Huh? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was exaggerating. But you normally do. Here's Shalon Baker. And he takes some punishment before getting outside the 10. 18 seconds to go. No, you looked at these two defenses. You saw a couple of rookie quarterbacks. And never in my wildest expectations would I expect 77 points. But the true facts of that, that the Calgary Stampeders were able to score 51 points against a secondary that was just truly makeshift out there. Patchwork, you were trying to put a Band-Aid on somebody that had cut a juggler vein. I knew you'd try to get me off the hook. I am. I'm working on you. I'm helping you. Buddy. Garcia, who did battle in the Big West, and 